All right, everybody, we are getting close to that time for our last session of the day. Um, even before COVID made us go digital, we decided we were going to end a little earlier on Friday because we know it's a, it's, it's a lot of information. And uh, I want to thank, I haven't looked through the, the list to see if any of our speakers are still hanging out. Uh, again, I want to thank all of our speakers. Uh, great content, uh, I think, up and down, left and right. Uh, really does take a lot of time. I think I made this point yesterday that even for folks that have done these talks or variations of these talks many times, it takes time, it takes effort. We really, really appreciate it. We really appreciate everyone sharing their expertise. Um, so our final session for today and for the conference is brought to us by Glenda Sims from DQ. Um, Glenda is, uh, God, when did we, we met a long time ago. I'm really spoiled in the accessibility world because there's so many amazing people, and uh, I've been able to, to get to know uh, a, a few of them. Um, but Glenda's here to talk about efficient and effective design, conserving cognitive energy, and I will do as I have done with everyone else, Glenda. I'll stop my share. Awesome. And I will mute myself, and I will leave it to you. And I am going to attempt to share my desktop. And tell me, can you see my first slide? Yes, indeed. Fantastic. All right. Well, let's get rolling. Um, I know you may feel like you can't put one more piece of information in your head, but I'm cognizant of that and want to share some really important lessons that I've learned over the past few years about efficient and effective design related to cognition. Um, because really, mental energy is a terrible thing to waste. We do not have excess mental energy. Um, I'll make sure I got the right. Oh, come on. I'm going to have to use the arrows. Yeah, it worked. <laughs> um, so I do introduce myself commonly as Glenda the Good Witch Sims. Um, I have the great honor to work at DeQ. I've been here since 2011. Prior to that, Louie and I worked together at UC Austin, so I worked with Louie twice. He's fantastic. Um, and, you know, I live, sleep, and breathe um, accessibility. With that, um, I want to share a quote with you that has inspired me for quite a while now. For most people, technology makes things easier. For people with disabilities, technology may make things possible. This comes from the National Council on Disability. And this quote is very important for this area of cognitive, as you'll soon see. I had the great pleasure of being involved in the creation of WCAG 2.1. Raised my hand, volunteered, worked on it. Hardest work I've ever done in my life. Um, and there were a number of new success criteria added in WCAG 2.1. And I mention it here because let's just compare um, where help got added. Four new success criteria were added for people with low vision things that we knew we could improve for people with low vision. And if you'll notice, I have a little note down there that two additional user needs didn't get satisfied with new success criteria. So two things left unsolved. With mobile, we came a long way. We added six new success criteria. Three got deferred because, you know, it's just, it's hard to write uh, WCAG success criteria. Speech only got one um, for p if you're trying to interface with something via speech alone, uh, and that was important, and a new community group was added. But I want you to notice something a little odd down in cognitive. One new success criteria, 32 deferred, couldn't figure out how to write a success criteria for it needs. That's sad. And cognitive had been waiting a long time. They'd always been told, uh, you know, wait till we get to this 2.1 version. We'll get some more cognitive in. One. So what is it? Why, why haven't we been able to solve um, cognitive accessibility yet? Why couldn't we get um, more? In, in WCAG 2.1? Why did, why did mobile get so many? And it, it was a struggle 
And what I came to this conclusion is when we're trying to solve something for screen readers or keyboard or low vision or hearing, there's often a one size fits many. But when it comes to cognitive, more often than not, one size does not fit all. So I think it's a more complex problem. It's not that we don't care. It's just, it's gonna be harder to figure out exactly what the standards need to set. So with that in mind, I want to tell you something that took me months to figure out. Everybody was saying Koga, 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 and, and you'll see the C-O-G-A. And I'm like, what does that stand for? And then ding, the C-O-G is for cognitive and the A is for accessibility. So just thought I'd share that little thing with you in case I start saying Koga, you'll know what I mean, cognitive accessibility. So I had the amazing fortune of getting on the W3C Cognitive Accessibility Task Force. And I think uh, two years ago, Rob, when I was there in Oklahoma, I was brand new on that task force. And this task force is doing amazing work, very important work, such hard work. Um, and thanks to you, Rob, um, I was, I met Jenny, who's over in the red jacket on this slide, uh, Jenny DeLisi, she spoke at uh, Tech Access OK two years ago, and she has become a strong force in the COGA task force. So little do you know what happens when you create a conference in Oklahoma that you actually positively impacted cognitive accessibility of the W3C. Didn't know if you knew that. Um, so on this cognitive task force, what are they doing at the W3C? They're doing a ton of research and they're finding the gaps. Where are the user needs? And where are the standards for accessibility just not there for people with cognitive disabilities? And they're in, very involved in WCAG 2.2, whatever number we go up to, and the future requirements, as well as tired of waiting for the standard to come out, They've recently published a design guide called Content Usable. So my deck will be available. Um, and this is the beginning of how you can start to wrap your mind around it. But before you go dive in and read that, um, I do have to say one thing. Um, the picture that I have on the screen shows faces of a number of people that are highly involved in the Cognitive Task Force, including someone I have a brain crush on, um, Jamie Knight from the BBC. Um, and Lisa Seaman, who leads the group, and of course, Jenny DeLisi, who I met because of Rob. Um, so we were gathered in the United Kingdom uh, for a face-to-face -face meeting, and it was very meaningful. It was January 2019, I believe. So what I'm about to share with you comes from my experiences of having worked with those brilliant people on the Cognitive Task Force, but I'm not speaking for them. I'm telling you what I've learned. So this is the, the, the Glenda cocktail hour on, on Cognitive. Um, and so when I say, how do we define cognitive disabilities? I'm not defining it for the W3C, just in, in general, how do we think about cognitive disabilities? And let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am a girl that graduated from the University of Texas at Austin with a psychology degree. And I've been in the programming web world for more than 30 years, uh, programming 30 years web uh, accessibility 20, a digital accessibility 20. And yet I'll tell you, even with that background of psychology degree, and I really get cognitive differences and needs, um, the whole concept of cognitive accessibility, um, it overwhelmed me. 
And so if you're on chat right now, I'd love to see, does anybody else resonate with that? Where it's like, you know, I'm happy to help a person that's blind because I understand how screen readers work. And I'm happy to help people that can't use a mouse because I know how keyboards work. But this whole concept of cognitive is like, it's so big. Anybody feel that way? Put, put it in chat so I'll know you, you're, you're kind of in the same space as I am. And as I, as I start to look at this, it's perfectly understandable why we might get overwhelmed. Here are just a handful of examples of cognitive disabilities. Dementia, Alzheimer's, intellectual disabilities where a person might have a lower IQ, aphasia, forgetting words, um, ability to um, understand or speak language, autism, any kind of focus issue with attention deficit or hyperactivity, and I'm seeing people that are having that uh, in their families or in their own lives, um, dyslexia, or I didn't even know what the word dyscalculia means, and I certainly can't pronounce it very well, but it's um, when it's hard to read numbers. And these particular examples, just a handful of examples, I pulled from a fascinating document. So if you ever wanted to dive deeper, um, there's a group called the European Telecommunication Standards Institute. Um, so if you hear us say Etsy, E-T-S-I, it stands for that, not the craft shopping place, although I like that too, but Etsy. Um, and this is where I started to pull some of these from. I could have pulled them from another textbook, but I thought it was interesting because this particular document that I pulled them from was, what are the human factors that we need to consider when designing digital and in specific the document that I pulled for from was designing mobile with thoughtfulness about cognitive disability. So really fantastic research. So as I tried to wrap my mind around this, I thought, you know what? This is so personal. And on that list on the page before, I listed some um, of the more medical type of cognitive disabilities. Um, but what if we talk about depression or bipolar or anxiety? And, and I'm like, you know, really hold the phone. We're, we're getting into personal territory here. And that's when it hit me. I found a way to make this easier to approach, at least for me, and let's see if it um, resonates with you. So how about instead of focusing on cognitive disabilities, what if we focus on cognitive skills? And by cognitive skills, I'm gonna give you a short list of basic cognitive skills. This is not every cognitive skill, but examples. The ability to pay attention is a cognitive skill. Memory, processing speed, time management, being able to perceive and understand letters and language, the same with numbers, symbols, and math. And then the last one that I have on my short list of examples is making choices and understanding choices. Again, if you look down at the bottom of this slide, where is Glenda coming up with this list? Is she just like daydreaming and jotting things down? Well, sure, that happens. So I'd been thinking about these things. And then when I got my hands on this beautiful Etsy document, they had used these categories. So I might have called them something a little bit different, but I was like, hey, I'm going to base this on research. So I'm gonna take you one step further on these cognitive skills and say, in trying to even look at those, how many is it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I thought, you know, I was reading a wonderful um, publication called Unlock the Einstein Inside. And it's written for, I believe, educators, uh, to help 
students with different cognitive needs. And there was this graphic in there that as I was reading that and I had all this other cognitive work, I was, I was like, oh, there's a piece of our cognitive skills that are automatic. And then there's a piece of our cognitive skills that's higher thinking. And if I start to break it down like this, I don't have to solve every problem every person has in all these categories, but it gives me something to, just like Louis said, it's like something to start with some place to take a step forward. So if you can't see my screen, let me describe what I've got up here. Um, I've got a section of three cognitive skills, each in a circle, um, where they're marked as automatic processing. Do you even have my attention? How fast can something processing speed happen in my brain is the second one. And the third is short-term memory. So when an input comes in, whether it's my voice or the doorbell or your phone text going off, does it have your attention? Did your, was your brain able to process it with the right speed so that it can get up into your short-term memory? Then it moves into higher thinking of, what am I going to do with that? What decision am I going to make when the doorbell rings? We reach into long-term memory, logic and reason. We may reach into language processing and math processing, and then we make a decision and have an output. So with this as our map, I propose, it's a little less frightening <laughs> to jump into cognitive disabilities. With this in mind, what I wanted to do is give you beginning steps because honestly, we could talk a whole hour about why it matters and how it matters. And you might share stories from your own life or from a, a person that you love, maybe your family member or a best friend. It's like, yes, they have that different need. Um, but I didn't want this to just be theoretical. I wanted you to be able to walk away with this with actionable design principles, at least the first steps. So let's look at what can we do to help with attention, with memory, and with processing speed. All right, attention. Let's think about that for a moment, whether it's focusing your attention or maintaining it? And how is this related to maybe different cognitive uh, challenges? Um, it's certainly a challenge for someone that's been diagnosed with ADD or ADHD. My husband is ADD, my oldest child. I, I totally understand um, how this can impact somebody in the school environment or the work environment. You know what else affects attention? Depression, anxiety, grief. If I'm hangry, hungry and then angry because I'm still hungry. <laughs> it can also be I've got a headache. Or somebody mentioned when I was brainstorming these decks um, is medications. Somebody in, in cancer treatment with chemo. It doesn't have the same level of attention. And so we can look at this from an accessibility lens. We can also look at it from a gorgeous universal design lens. This is helping every single one of us. Hungry, stressed, not feeling well. Anybody feeling any COVID stress? Anybody completely stressed about what's happening in the world on the news? It's, it's heartbreaking and it takes away from our cognitive energy. So what can we do? What are some simple steps that we can take to make it easier when we design an interface to focus and maintain attention? On this slide, I've got three major points. Got way too much text on the slide. Shame on Glenda because this breaks a cognitive principle. Apologies. Um, I'm trying to fit too much into, into 50 minutes. 
bad witch. Um, but just these three principles, increase, maintain, and regain focus, help me find what I need on your page or on the screen. Don't make me dig. The important information stands out. Don't make me wade through a wall of information. Just give me the information I need at this stage. Ever missed the feedback on a site where it's trying to tell you busy success or an error? Make it clear, help people find what they need. Limiting interruptions is crucial. Ability to filter out things, um, I don't know about you, um, I will say I'm attending regular services on Sunday mornings using Facebook Live. I filter out the chat on the side because I can't listen to the speaker and deal with all that chat on the side. I want to filter it out. Time limits. Avoid setting time limits because the moment we have an uh, an interruption, we could get lost from the task at hand and be able to stop distractions. Now, if you're looking detail at my slide, you'll see we are getting some help from the WCAG success criteria, but not on each one of these points yet. So for example, stop distractions is a WCAG requirement called 2.2.2 pause stop hide. Um, and the ability to recover from a distraction. Can I go back uh, to where I lost my focus? This happens to me all the time now in um, Audible when I'm listening to a book, because I'll fall asleep. <laughs> I certainly wasn't paying attention. I need to be able to go back. Um, or to restart. Um, how many of you, or have any of you heard of the concept of spoons? for a way to say to people, this is how much energy, mental energy I have for the day and I count it in spoons. Um, it's a, you can look it up on, on Wikipedia. It's called spoon, uh, I think it's called spoon theory. Um, and when you think about this, I want to tell you what one of my uh, dear friends in the COGA task force of the W3C says. She says, you know what? I may hit my limit after working on something for an hour and I cannot work on it again today. I have to be able to walk away and come back. If you won't let me do that, if we won't let Lisa do that, she's never going to make it through the process. Has to be able to save where she was, completely walk away and come back later. So these are three things that you can do. Now, as I mention this to you, and you're thinking, hmm, you know what? I knew all these things already. They're just usability. And I'm going to say, mm -mm. it is a strong overlap with usability. But here's the difference. If you don't design this way and a person does have these cognitive challenges, it is accessibility for them. So the nice thing about this is if you were like me and you were approaching cognitive accessibility from the disability standpoint, it was like, oh, overwhelming. And I stair-stepped you through, wait, let's throw those medical terms aside and just go for cognitive skills. Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm willing to, to go on this path with you. And now I'm telling you, you got a head start if you already understand usability for regular people, for, for every day, all of us, and there's a universal design element, but now it's more than just nice to have. You're starting to understand it may be the difference between a person being able to do it or not. All right, so we did one, and that was stair-stepping into focus and attention. Let's look at the next one on memory. Both short-term memory and long-term memory um, are important to keep in mind. 
And maybe you're like me, I'm a minimalist and don't like to do things that are repetitive. Um, and don't ask me a question if you already know the answer. I'm thinking of how many times in the old days in a doctor's office, I would have to fill out the same form with the same information that they already knew and multiple ones. <laughs> I'm just like, mm, mm completely making me rely on memory or pull things out of my purse. But let's talk about who these people might be from a disability standpoint, traumatic brain injury, a person that has stroke. It may be medical, medicine-induced, like chemo, dementia, Alzheimer's. And let me ask you this, how good is your memory when you're stressed? not feeling well, or perhaps getting into those ages that are older and thinking about retirement, our memory does fade a bit. So what can we do about memory so that we rely less on it? We design better and areas where memory is common, uh, commonly a barrier is user authentication. Um, I'm, I'm an iPhone girl. And I remember when it first came out to open your phone with your thumbprint. And I thought that was silly. I was like, I don't need that. It's really cool. And now I don't have to remember a password. So when we think about user authentication, it's a convenience for me not to have to remember a password or to type it in for a person with a memory issue that might have dementia or Alzheimer's or traumatic brain injury, the ability to use your thumb to open your phone or now it's your face. Um, that helps. Auto filling in, allowing things to be auto filled in on our websites makes a big difference. Consistency, which any good design should have. And don't hide important frequent controls. Now, y'all are probably not guilty of this, but have you checked out any of the apps the kids are using? The controls aren't intuitive. They're not even visible. You have to know to swipe this way or that way or shake your phone or I don't know what <laughs> to watch the kids to figure it out. Um, when you hide those important controls, How's a person with any kind of a memory issue going to find it in the first place or remember it's there when they can't see it? And then grouping content, again, from that Etsy uh, research uh, over in the European Union, um, they were talking about grouping similar items semantically and visually uh, with no more than a max group size of five, especially for auditory. And I just thought that was fascinating. So just sharing some tips that I learned in this research. There are a few more on memory, and that is let people know where they are especially when you're in a process. Um, being able to restart, which we talked about a little bit before. Providing help that's context sensitive. And coming back to the concept of one size does not fit all. If you're starting to get into the zone where we're really trying to solve things for people with cognitive differences, we're going to have to think about more personalized solutions. Um, when I get into my car and put on my seatbelt, um, there's not a one size fits all seatbelt. Um, I have a Honda. I can adjust the piece on the side so that it comes closer down to my shoulder. And the, the whole seatbelt mechanism fits to me. This is personalization. What if our websites did that? What if we could tune our websites? This is where I see us going. And you don't need to worry about that right now. I just want to plant the seed that cognitive solutions are going to be more personalized where there are dials for you to tune it. So when we think about 
these first two things of focus and memory, I want you to think when you're looking at your sites, are you designing something that requires more mental energy than necessary? Is that really what you want to do? And in a commerce situation, let's imagine we're on Amazon or um, Etsy, E-T-S-Y, um, wouldn't you rather that whoever that customer is use that energy to complete a key transaction as opposed to remember where something is on your website? Back to that spoon theory, we only have so much cognitive energy in each given day. Why waste it on something that could have been more visually or apparently intuitive and let them finish the task that requires their brain power? It's a great way to, to sell the importance of this. I wanna do at least one more piece when it comes to the skills and to give you at least, thank you for the article on spoons in the, in the chat. Um, processing speed and time. Um, I get anxious <laughs> when there's timers on things. I don't think I have an official cognitive disability on it, but I've noticed in, in games or interfaces when there's something timed, um, I'll actually perform with less ability because my anxiety rises. I'll, I'll tell you what I, how it happened to me last night um, in just a minute. But accessibility for something that has a time limit especially a short time limit requires certain speed is going to impact any cognitive disability. Um, it can impact all of cognitive disabilities and can certainly impact us from a universal design perspective. Um, how many of you uh, have been watching in this in this period of stay at home more than we're used to? Um, you know, shows on Hulu, Amazon Prime, et cetera, et cetera. And I cannot figure out how to get the auto start to um, stop when I'm watching a show. And on Amazon Prime, I have exactly five seconds when watching the end of the show. It's on settings on my phone and my computer, I can get it to stop, but I can't get it to stop on my TV. That, so Ashley, maybe you can come over and show me how to do it on my TV, because I can't figure it out. Um, and I got five seconds to get it, and I'm just like, oh, all stressed out trying to do it. So when we think about uh, processing and speed, what I wanna say is, um, you know what? People have different needs when it comes to processing speed. And, and there's no reason to make people anxious. So how about we don't set time limits unless they're absolutely critical? There's a, a WCAG principle. It's, it's a triple A, so most people don't do it. Um, but for no timing. I want you to think about it. Can you, can you, now from a security standpoint, I understand our systems need to time out after a certain period of time. In WCAG 2.0 and 2.1, we have a timing adjustable. And, and notice how all of a sudden the things that I'm telling you here, they all have a WCAG principle uh, and, and a success criteria associated with them. Why? Because they were more, for more than just cognitive. So they figured it out already. Um, but 2.2.1 timing adjustable, the ability to turn off, adjust, extend. There is an exception for if it's over 20 hours. Um, and here's one, we tried to get it into 2.1. Oh, actually it was in 2.0. We tried to get it moved up to double A. We tried to get it out of triple A into double A. Wouldn't it be dang nice to let people know a time limit exists before it's about to time out. We don't, that's not in the requirements yet. <laughs> it's like, we couldn't even get that one passed, but, but, but no, I, I digress. Um, there were, it was a lot of work and, and, and it's okay. It's okay. Progress is made. Um, so try and avoid time limits. And when you do, 
even though it's not a requirement, let people know in advance. So I could honestly talk for a long time about Cognitive, but I want to make sure that there's time for questions and I'm going to double check where we are in time time. And I thought we could squeeze in one more thing before I give you a high level wrap. And in this automatic processing, you're going to notice what I, what, sorry, in cognitive skills that I broke this down to, I, I really focus on automatic processing because if we don't deal with the cognitive needs of automatic processing, you didn't even make it into the brain. You didn't get my attention. It went too fast. I couldn't handle the speed. Short term memory, you required something and, and I couldn't get not even in. So I started with those. And then as we look up at the ones, the higher thinking, which probably each one of those could take an hour uh, talk at least, which one would you want to hear the most? Now, I've already got my deck prepared, so I'm not magic. <laughs> but what I heard from most people is language processing, language processing, language processing. So that's the one I chose. And there's another reason I chose language processing, and that is I got a friend. So I'm going to, uh, yay, I read somebody's mind. So how can we support different levels of language processing? This is a big one, and I'm kind of excited about some research that's going on. So in an earlier picture where there were a bunch of us from the W3C Cognitive Task Force. Uh, there was a gentleman, John Rochford. He's almost always wearing a baseball cap, so he's easy to find. Um, and he happens to be a researcher at the University of Massachusetts. And get what this di guy does. Oh, um, you know, he specializes in artificial intelligence, data science, and cognitive accessibility. Okay, that's cool. And I didn't know who this man was four years ago. I met him through work that I was doing uh, when I was helping with CAD 2.1. He was on the low vision task force. He's very low vision. Um, and then I started working with him elbow to elbow on the cognitive task force. At CSUN 2019, he presented a topic called Create Simple Web Text for People with Intellectual Disabilities, which he calls ID, and Train Artificial Intelligence. And I'm like, John speaking, I'm going. It was one of my favorite presentations that year. And what's really cool is John has a dream. Here is his dream. Can we make web text so simple it can be understood the first time it is read? And I'm a person who, I'm a minimalist and I like simplicity. I don't want to make you dumb it down. I don't want you to lose the nuance, but I think it's actually harder to write clearly and simply. I think it's easier to write things that are complex. And the complexity actually creates barriers. And so I love what John's doing here. And then this man and the way he approaches things it blows me away. Um, his research is highly motivated by, I hope y'all are sitting down, um, helping people with intellectual disabilities. That's some pretty big words. Um, what that means to me is what I know he does. Let's imagine you know someone with Down syndrome. And let's imagine their current intellectual ability level is third grade reading and math. Do you think that that person is going to be able to hold a job independently, live in an apartment independently, make their own medical decisions? Third grade, that's all they've got. John wants to figure that out. That's one of his motivators. 
not just people with Downs, but intellectual disabilities. And I was using that as an example. And I'm like, dang, <laughs> you, are, you are brave, courageous, and awesome. So when we, when we look back at this dream, make web text so simple it can be understood the first time it's read, and then we look forward at how can we simplify it now, I wanted you to understand some of the motivations under it and the real research he's doing and testing with, with, with people not just computers. Um, his short term is to come up with guidelines for people to use now. How can we simplify text now, human process? Long term, artificial intelligence to do it. To operationalize what people are doing manually and to build algorithms so that the AI can simplify the text. And then he dropped the big idea on me when he said, there's really a lot of parallel between people with intellectual, intellectual disabilities and artificial intelligence. And I'm like, what? They both have a very limited understanding of the world. I'm like, oh, he's so brilliant. He's so brilliant. So from this research, which I will um, give you direct access to in, in this deck, um, he's got six steps for where he started on this. And the sixth one is gonna seem a little weird, so uh, wait and I'll explain it to you. Um, we need to use shorter and simpler words. Don't use the highfalutin ones. Um, shorter sentences help. Avoid using acronyms and abbreviations. Use an active voice in the present tense. Use correct grammar and spelling. And the thing with about removing proper nouns is you can't change a proper noun to something sim simpler. If you need to write the word supercalifragilisticexpialidocious or you need to say John Krasinski, that's his name. You're not going to get to change it. And so pull it out and don't count it against yourself. And it, he's doing this so that his artificial intelligence can do it as well. And I don't know if any of you have ever used the Hemingway app, but Ernest Hemingway was an author who liked to write this way. And I'm not saying everything needs to be written this way. And I'm not saying don't ever use the longer word, but be thoughtful about it. Um, and, and don't write to people's highest education levels because, okay, I got a bachelor's degree. So what would that be? Grade 16. Do I really want to read at grade 16 all day long? No. Don't. I don't need to. Only use the level of language that you actually need. So, um, if somebody wants to be my best friend, go Google Hemingway app and find the link and drop it into chat because be still my heart. Um, talk about simplifying my writing. Um, I use the tool like crazy. I will admit, apologies, I do not think it's accessible. Um, so there are probably other tools that we could recommend, but this is the beginning of what I'm, I'm talking about and some tools you could use right now to make it easier for your information to be understood. Don't write to that high level when you could have written to a level that used a lot less energy and let the people reading it save that energy for something that really required. So... If we were in a workshop, I would actually have us do a, a, a workshop on a plain language example um, and playing around with content that I had found a complex version of. And if you want to play this game at home later, the site is called newsinlevels.com. 
So you can see news written in the simplest, in the intermediate, and the more advanced level so that you can play around with these concepts. And I'm not saying that news and level has it perfect, but it's just, did we have to write it in that complex of a way? So John Rochford is one of my heroes. When this deck is shared with you, you will have direct access to his research um, and watch uh, what he does because I think he's got some wonderful things. He's very active in the, in the cognitive workforce at the W3C. So I hope at this point we've um, just been going for less than an hour that you feel a little bit more comfortable with cognitive disability because you've kind of morphed into cognitive skill. And that you have some actionable things that you can do for attention, memory, processing speed, and plain language. There are first steps. We could have entire sessions on other things. Um, so great deep topic. But, you know, I didn't want to end there. I wanted to talk about motivation. Why would you even be motivated for cognitive accessibility? Well, let me ask you, is it personal? Are you doing it? Are you doing it because it's in your heart? You may even be doing it for yourself. Are you doing it because there's someone that you love that will really benefit from this? Are you doing it because it's the right thing to do? It's humanitarian to help other people. What a wonderful thing to think about in these weeks where less than humanitarian things have been happening. We can make a difference. And as we think about the motivations, I think that these these three that I have listed make so much sense to so many of us who are passionate about accessibility. But I want to add one that may surprise you. Profit. Cognitive accessibility for profit, for money. What in the world is Glenda talking about? Well, take a look at this. According to Jacob Nielsen, seniors are 35% less likely to complete a purchase online than someone under the age of 55. And the older we get, the more cognitive challenges we're going to face. In that same research, Jacob calls out people's ability to use websites effectively declines 0.8%, which accumulates every year over the age of 25. Pair this information with where's the money at in the United States? Who's got the money? You know who has the money? They are over 50 years old. So the average wealth distribution in the United States by age in 2016 is in the aged population. You can sell this. This really is about profit. Now, I'm not highly motivated by the dollar. I am motivated about doing it for humanity reasons. Um, but we have to look at this from all angles and businesses do need to have strong bottom lines. Governments, especially in this age of COVID where, oh, um, you know, where did our oil money go? 10,000 people turn 65 years old every day. And borrowing from a phrase from my mentor, John Slayton, who always said to me, good design is accessible design. Well, I'll tell you, good design is cognitively efficient design. Because if you conserve mental energy, you will increase your return on investment. With that said, um, I think we're at time for questions. Rob, do we have any questions queued up? I have not seen any folks have had good comments. Um, we do have a couple of the 
reading level sites that you mentioned, well, Hemingway first, and then a couple of others, one that came up yesterday. Awesome. Uh, but no, I haven't seen questions come in. Let me scroll through and make sure I have not overlooked anything. All right. Well, I, I deeply enjoyed sharing my passion for cognitive accessibility with y'all today. And I, I really do predict that, you know, there's been so much creativity and invention and invention that have come out of accessibility for the blind um, and the hearing and the motor. And um, I believe that we're going to get more from cognitive, it, it's the next great adventure in accessibility. Yeah, I agree. And there's such a, a big focus on it, I feel like. I feel like the community, the accessibility community in the last five years maybe, especially in Glenda, maybe little much, not enough, has realized we, we, we have some gaps and really started to realize in terms of standards, in terms of that kind of specific, mm -hmm. what can we put into a standard set uh, kind of, of conversation, there's a big, big gap. So I think the, the task force coming together was, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't call it the culmination, but just like a manifestation of yeah. that understanding. So um, yeah, fantastic. And that's why, uh, again, why we, why we wanted you to come in and, and, and talk to this audience about it, because it's something that, you know, we can't point to a set of standards yet. We can't, we can point to good practice, uh, which is exactly what you set out for us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and let's not wait for the standard, because I will tell you this, building standards is hard. <laughs> right. And it takes a really long time. And getting consensus agreement across um, all the industries on this is more challenging than anything we've done in the field of accessibility before. And so um, don't expect the, the standards to come out with success criteria at the A or AA a level um, as quickly as they're needed. Um, but we can look at some really fabulous guidance. Um, and so I, I'm hopeful and um, we, can, we continue to work on it. Heck, it gives me something to do if I ever retire, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> if you ever retire. Um, somebody posed a question. I didn't even read the whole thing. Oh, what is it called when you're talking to someone and you start to put your iced tea in the microwave instead oh. of the fridge? I'll have to look that one up, David, because I'm not sure what that's called, but that, um, that, may, that certainly is cognitive. <laughs> Yeah, and I think too that this time in human history, even well, so it's beginning with COVID, yeah. and now with the 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 last two weeks of protests, which now I think are hopefully turning into conversation, yeah. it's still a load on everybody, mm -hmm. and I, I think that everyone is lower on spoons. I don't want to um, I don't want to take that that metaphor. Uh, I don't want to co-opt that, but there's just less brain space. There's a lot more static uh, for just about everybody, which which makes doing things that before were maybe a little tricky, but not that bad. Now it's at the very least uh, frustrating and at worst difficult, I think. Yeah, and, and I, I think what's fascinating about it is that the cognitive disability, you can't see it, right? It's, it's not as it's not physically obvious what's going on and many people don't they they really don't understand how much that barrier is just as real as i can't see it or i can't hear it and all of a sudden now many of us are experiencing cognitive overload and it gives us a level of not exact understanding, but a deeper level of compassion um, and caring and a willingness to, to, to do something about it. Um, so I, I'm, I'm inspired by the topic and feel that it benefits us all. It either benefits us right now or it's gonna benefit us next week. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You know, and I think the other thing that it, it does is it helps 
a bigger group of people um, actually encounter barriers, right? I mean, when something that you could do online before that was, again, maybe frustrating, maybe too many steps, and now you're, uh, you're trying to go through the same steps and you're just like, what is this? And I'm, I'm lost because my mind wandered further than it normally would or than it would, maybe not normally, as, but you know, three months ago, my mind wouldn't have gone quite as far. And now when it, when it does, some of the things that you brought up about give people, save what people, save the progress, right? Don't make it so that if someone forgets to come back to it, which I've done a lot of, um, the, that everything is just gone. Uh, so, you know, creating some of those fail safes. And, and I think that's another layer of it that, that those of us that don't have a cognitive disability uh, but are starting to bounce off of some of these barriers uh, can understand it in a much different way. And, and I, I'm not going to suggest that we're, we're developing cognitive disabilities. It's just I, I think that there is some genuine kind of empathy because all of us are going, oh, this is harder now than it was uh, two months ago, three months ago. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and there's, there's this one story, I don't know if you've ever heard Whitney Cuisenberry speak. She's a, a usability expert that often comes to Access U. Um, but she was involved in a research study with the medical profession. And I want you to think about um, the type of information that you need when you're sick or when someone you care for is sick. Um, and you're looking online and it can get overwhelming fast, big terms, complex concepts, et cetera. And so Whitney was involved in creating a more usable patient portal for that information. And there was also a different portal for the doctors because certainly the PhDs weren't going to want the patient level simplified information. They were going to want their highfalutin, how many grades is that of a PhD? And my favorite moment is when um, Whitney goes, guess which portal the doctors used most? Mm -hmm. The patient one. <laughs> sure, they might have to dig down into the doctor one, but even they appreciated it more. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> And I love Ashley said earlier um, that the simplification in their uh, in the language in a question in a test um, uh, makes for better results. I've written a lot of test questions. I actually, um, if you're involved anywhere in the IAAP uh, certification, um, the CPAC. What is that? Certified Professional in Accessibility Core Competencies. I think that's what it stands for. Um, I helped write questions for that. And um, you have to write questions in a certain way so that you're not testing the person's ability to read your dang question, you're testing their knowledge. So on the CPAC, the questions have to be written in the positive um, and there can only be four answers and only one of them is correct. And what that allows us to do is for second language speakers or translations, it makes sure we're actually testing the knowledge and not the how complex of a thought can you hold in your head at one time. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it makes it, it's one of those things that makes all the sense when people hear it. And I think it's a matter of now, uh, mm -hmm. you know, following the work that you all are doing on the task force and just taking a lot of your tips and applying them, you know, just the writing piece. A lot of the folks in the audience may not be developers, may not be building complex interactions. Yeah. Almost everyone has to write something, right? And so whether it's training material or it's uh, web content, whatever it might be, getting rid of the 25 cent words, right? You know, co coming, coming away with something that people can understand the first time through. Um, and, and we do, and I think all of us have heard well, maybe not all. I think many of us have heard the the notion that, well, I, and you said it, Glenda, I don't want to dumb down my content. Yeah. At the same time, you're making it so that people don't have to work as hard to process it. Is the goal, like you just said, is the goal testing how, how much brain capacity it takes to mm -hmm. understand content or to just make sure people can actually get it? And, and I tell people you're basically putting a fence or a higher fence around your stuff. 
with the more complex language. And I'm yeah. guilty of it. Few folks in the audience have read emails from me, um, but it's 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 something that that we can all do. We could literally begin to do it today. Any emails I type today are going to be very small words, very short sentences because I'm exhausted. But just in general, it's for sure uh, something that we that we can all begin to do. And Ashley, your point is exactly right. Is the goal to spread the message or to show how educated you are? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and you know you can easily fence your message away from your audience by using the 25 cent words. So uh, yeah, Glenda, thank you very much again. Really, it's great to have you back in the event. Uh, hopefully we can actually be in the same place at some point safely. Uh, you know, virtual hugs. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't see any other questions coming in. So I think that we'll, we'll wrap up. 